they identified um, ten. Um, they identified nine different groupings of hazard types in this typology. And just to take, give you an example, you know, when you look at biological hazards, they further categorized 10 different clusters of hazards. And in total, for example, in the biological uh, section, there's 88 different hazards they picked out. And all of these are, are sort of categorized. So they tried to set a framework for this kind of very much a multi-hazard approach, but there's a common definition that we can work towards. But you get a sense of the, the 10 different clusters, for example, in the biological hazards that um, you, know, you, can, you can look at in more detail. So this is all being published. You can, you can go and have a look at it uh, on the website if you're interested. But in terms of trends over the last, um, the, the last few decades or even the last 100 years, you, know, you can see actually in terms of deaths from disasters, we've actually been quite effective in reducing fatalities. Despite the huge population growth, um, actually disaster risk reduction measures have been very effective in reducing fatality loss. And that's reflected in this kind of graph, which you see um, from the 1900s uh, right up to 20. Now, the, I think the, the, the thing to bear in mind is things like improved early warning systems, um, improved uh, seismic building codes. Uh, been able to really reduce the impact uh, in terms of on the physical environment, but also move people to safety. So we have been quite effective in that sense. But it's also very interesting to look at uh, which hazards that have triggered those deaths um, during that period. And I think what would um, surprise a lot of people is actually, if you look in the early part of, part of the 20th century, it's routes that were actually responsible for most deaths. Uh, whereas in recent decades, you can see that actually the, the purple uh, section of the chart really, that's not been such a major threat in, in recent decades. And, and obviously globalization to the degree has helped us um, in terms of food supply and so we uh, uh, manage that more effectively. effectively. Well, one, one of the things that you can see in the chart as well is the growth, for example, in the threat in the 2000s, in the 10s, in the 20s. You can see that the increasing threat of extreme temperatures, which are not associated with the deaths, um, much earlier. So you, you, you get a sense of kind of some of the changing hazard profiles, the changing risks that we're facing. Now, in terms of uh, although we've been very effective in reducing the number of fatalities, what we actually see though is that the number of people affected has been greatly increasing. Now, of course, partly that's the reflection of the fact that population size is increasing, but it's also because lots of people think, you know, is more prone or exposed to the hazards uh, such as I've identified. Now, in terms of who's, the number of people exposed, the hazards most responsible for that are um, flooding, so that again, and, and also. Uh, to some degree, cyclones and hurricanes, storm events. But in terms of deaths, actually, it's it's actually different. So it's earthquakes and all from that, which have been uh, most devastating, also by by storm events. But when you look at the data in more detail, what you can also see is that actually it's lower middle income countries and low income countries that are most um, badly impacted in terms of death rates from these types of hazards. So high income countries have been far better, they have far greater capacity to deal with those risks and to reduce the, the human losses from them. However, in, when it comes to economic damages, again, what we can also see um, over the, the last sort of 50 years is that Total economic damages as a share of GDP has also been increasing. So economic losses is, is also a major threat because of course that also restricts our ability to address other key development objectives, things like uh, reducing poverty, um, access to clean water. So some of these types of objectives will be damaged if we don't have um, if the economic uh, growth isn't there as well. And again, 
in, in terms of economic losses, it's storm events, uh, also followed by uh, earthquakes and also flooding that have been most responsible for economic damages. When we, we break that down over the last 20 years or so. Now, if you look at Sri Lanka specifically, of course, what's interesting is that you can realize how, how uh, challenging it is to look at past events as an indicator of future disaster risk. So, of course, dominating uh, in terms of the number of deaths um, in, uh, in Sri Lanka is, of course, is the tsunami in 2004. But you can also see, if you look uh, in more in the 2010s, so 2010 to 2019, you can see flooding uh, and also landslides um, and I think it's, yeah, and storm events are being killed here in Sri Lanka from, from those types of hazards. And again, if we look at the, the disaster occurrences by type, we can look, look at Sri Lanka specifically across the, the various different uh, hazard categories, uh, and you can see the typological events, so really um, flooding, storms, um, and also um, landslides that are triggered by that kind of intense precipitation. Uh, they've been responsible for the most occurrences, and also a significant number of people um, killed and injured from that. Of course, again, the tsunami dominating in terms of the geophysical elements, but you also have, for example, biological hazards, and Dengue has been a, you know, a significant factor in, in, the, uh, in recent years. What isn't reflected, of course, here is COVID. We miss it anyway, the data is, is running up to 2019. But actually, if you, if you look at the uh, EMDAT database, which is you know, a general common reference point for um, um, managing data sets associated with disaster risk, um, if you can actually look at all of the, the disaster occurrences by kind of reported here in Sri Lanka uh, since, for example, 2014, um, and you get a sense of all of the, the different individual events and their impacts. So you can, you can go and kind of scrutinize that database yourself. I think the one thing that's notable, again, is the absence of COVID. So in common with most countries, then we're not reporting COVID-19 deaths uh, and impacts in these types of databases because the, the accuracy of that data is seen to be so flawed at the moment uh, and the different ways of reporting uh, the impacts. So at the moment, it's um, COVID-19 tends to sit outside um, what we, we generally use as a reference point for disaster occurrences and impacts. So that's a kind of brief um, overview in terms of the trends over the last 20 years and, and even over the last uh, century. I just want to pick up briefly on what are the underlying risk factors behind those trends. Well, of course, we know that population growth has been a very significant factor. I think the population here in Sri Lanka has doubled at least since the 1960s. Um, although now the population growth is, is, is quite low here in Sri Lanka. Uh, and of course, you've actually seen, if anything, a lot of outward migration as well in, in, in the last few years. But still, globally, population growth has been a major driver of, of disaster risk. And a lot of that population growth is occurring in uh, lower income and low income countries. So it's, again, it's those countries that tend not to have the capacity to, to deal with those types of risks. Another main driver is in terms of the extent of urbanization. And of course, uh, this has been a global trend. Um, we've seen over the last uh, sort of 100 years or so, a gradual urbanization, and um, you know, there was a the tipping point within about 2012 where we were more urban than, than rural. And that's also that you when we in major urban centers, you can look at, for example, the growth of Metro Manila in the space of 35 
inflation rate, one of the lowest in the world. But I think this is more seen as an administrative uh, anomaly rather than the reality, which is better reflected when you you, uh, you look at the um, the charts here. Now that's kind of urbanization uh, and um, also uh, increase in population means that by 2030, we need 50% more food, 45% more energy, and 30% more water than we did in 2012. So you need all of the, that kind of economic development that surrounds that growth, which also is a factor in increasing risk. There's more assets exposed, the more dependent on those assets. And what we also see in many countries, um, and it, for example, in the background here, this is uh, Makati City in the Philippines, um, in Metro Manila. You see the contrast between the very great economic growth and also the sort of slum dwellings left behind. And you can also get perhaps similar images here in Colombo, where you have those kind of the, the big skyscrapers in the background, but there's also you know, informal settlements very highly exposed um, in terms of disaster risk. So you have this mismatch between the economic developments of urban expansion and the institutional mechanisms that are available to govern that risk. And don't think I'm putting all the blame on um, Sri Lanka and uh, Asia and the, the UK is just as responsible for this as well. We are very much uh, responsible for building in floodplains. And so we, we again we build in areas that aren't suitable um, for, for, for urban development. And um, this is just an example: uh, land development opportunity uh, in an area that's actually uh, just been flooded. And of course, this is going to become more of a challenge uh, in the years ahead with global environmental change. I probably don't need to talk too much about this; it's been very evident. Um, the kind of the uh, climate crisis. Uh, we're going to see an increase in the, the frequency and the intensity of uh, heavy precipitation events, um, and also things like sea level rise, which will have such devastating consequences. What's the impact of that? Well, for example, is your infrastructure, even your health infrastructure, is it designed for the climate of? 10 or 20 years ago, or the climate of 10, 20, 30 years into the future? You know, are you adapted to, to that, that climate? We need to think about displacement. We're going to see movement, internal displacement. People move away from areas that are not habitable anymore because they're at extreme temperatures, um, loss of livelihoods. So they'll relocate. Urbanization will probably continue. We know that climate change is reshaping the map of livable areas and therefore shifting population. So again, is your health infrastructure in the areas where people are going to be living in the next 10, 20, 30 years? Sri Lanka, uh, if you look at the, kind of the, the climate risk indexes, Sri Lanka is typically around 30th um, globally. So yeah, it's a, it, it is at quite extreme risk from the, the impacts of um, of climate change. There's lots of reports that set out those risks. Um, but for, for example, some of the analysis has shown that over the last 100 years, on average, the temperature is about 0.8, 0.9 degrees higher than it was um, 100 years ago. So you, you get a sense of, again, the challenges that we'll be facing in the years ahead. And I think what's also in, important is that the, the, the Temperature rise has accelerated in recent decades, and that's again at the moment that trend is increasing. And we also need to think about the compound uh, hazards, so the impact of climate change on things like infectious diseases. So we know that things like dengue, there are links between uh, dengue and the, the climate and the, the nature of precipitation events. So again, are we going to see a recurrence of maybe malaria in the future, increased threat from that? These things, you know, I think some aspects that you may, may want to consider in your planning. And you could also link climate change to so many other issues. So for example, we could look at um, 
mental health. A lot of young people, certainly in Europe, and I think it's probably the same here, getting very uh, a lot of anxiety over the threats that they're facing. Um, and there's a lot of studies now looking at this. Also, the impact of things like COVID-19 and uh, the economic crisis here on Sri Lanka. What's the impact on the mental health of young people living here now? We can also look at some of the other you know, major drivers, things like ecosystem decline, uh, deforestation, of course, is a, a contributor to things like um, landslide risk. And things like globalization and supply chain interdependencies. So you, you, you can get individual events like the tsunami, which devastated uh, Japan uh, back in 2012, and had huge implications in terms of the supply chain for cars that took many months to, to get rectified. with. But we also saw you know, huge supply chain disruption in COVID-19, um, and you can get quite you know, sudden events like the Suez Canal being blocked, and that suddenly you know, changes uh, supply chains around the world. And you might have you know, disruptions to your medical supplies, for example. How do you cope with that kind of uh, event? And these events don't all happen in isolation. You can get them happening concurrently. How do you manage those in very complex uh, risk contexts? And I think when you look at a country like Sri Lanka, you know, you've experienced a conflict, you've experienced an economic crisis, some political instability, along with things like COVID-19, so many different disruptive hazard events that can impact your ability to um, have the capacity really to deal with um, health emergency. And I could look at all sorts of other you know, risk drivers that we don't have time today. So just to finish off, um, I'm coming to the end of my 30 minutes. Uh, one of the things that's been really recognized through COVID-19 is the importance of systemic risk. So the idea that you know, one hazard can have compound and cascading hazards and impacts that really completely disrupt the system. They can disrupt the economy, they can disrupt the healthcare system, the education system, uh, the work context. So how do we manage that complexity in our planning? And you get you know, it, 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 natural hazards that trigger these chain of events, but you also have also you know, lots of independent uh, events. So I think the question I'd pose to you is, you know, what is the capacity of the healthcare system hospitals in Sri Lanka to deal with that kind of changing dynamic risk landscape that we're facing? And I think that may be something you may want to consider as part of these types of, of discussions. And just some closing thoughts. I think there are certain you know, um, strategies that you can use to, to address this. Firstly, is to move away from just, just a deterministic analysis, not just looking at historic events, but looking to more probabilistic analysis. So you can look at scenarios that haven't been encountered previously, rather than just looking at the past history. We, we can look at what's gone previously and build all of our um, preparedness plans around them. But how do we suddenly deal with those unexpected events that are often so devastating? So I think a more probabilistic approach can be, can be very helpful. We also need to uh, move away from the prediction and control um, and, and being reactive. Um, you know, we, we need to recognize there's a certain degree of uncertainty and how can we manage that uncertainty. We need to look at you know, moving away from just focusing on individual events looking at risk and that's where we can take a kind of more resilient space approach how resilient is a community to deal with all sorts of disruptive events that may impact them rather than just looking at for example flood risk or you know, tsunami risk and hazard mapping in that sort of sense so not just a single hazard focus but all hazards vulnerability and a capacity focus and of course, if you're going to do that, you need to move away from just looking at a single agency response. So we're not just looking at healthcare professionals, but you need to look at working as a multi-agency response. So how do you work with the DMC? Um, how do you work with sort of more civil protection um, 
police, fire, and the services. Um, all of these different stakeholders need to come together and, and work in a more kind of uh, integrated manner. And all the agencies have to serve their responsibility. So I'll, I'll close there because I think my 30 minutes is up. But um, just if you're interested about some of the work that we do at the Global Civilian Centre, uh, we do have an annual report which you can look at and you can see what we're doing um, around the world, but also here in China. So I'll close there. Thank you.